Hello, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in Internet Shitlords, and I welcome all of you, especially those of you who are already of the, the Shitlord army, and if you're not, then please uh, subscribe, share this video anywhere you can, um, especially where you think people find it interesting or get pissed off about it. I don't know how, how pissed off people are likely. Well, yeah, this video is about gaming, but there are still people that might get pissed off by it, sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, check out my products, stuff like... Dark Albion. Look at look at that back. Did you know that it comes with a whole beautiful map in the back cover? This is the hardcover edition here. Uh, or the Old School Companion, uh, which are these are the two tomes I'm going to be talking about in particular today. But uh, check out all my other stuff too. The uh, World of the Last Sun, the Gonzo Fantasy Companion, uh, Invisible College, Star Adventure, and all of my RPG Pundit Presents series, Arrows of Indra. Um, you know, you can find stuff. Oh, here's Meatball. Hey, Meatball. She's been very vocal today. I don't know what's going on with her, but there's something. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> She's got various issues she wants to comment on to the world. Um, so I, like I'm saying, there, there's uh, all kinds of stuff you can find in my products that you're going to be able to enjoy, and they're they're not very expensive. Um, so be sure to check them out. I mean, you know, you get a great bang for your buck. All right. As for uh, the topic of today, uh, I wanted to talk about domain rules. And, uh, you know, somebody had commented asking if I had them anywhere. And it's in these two books that I have them in, in, in Lion and Dragon. Uh, sorry, not Lion and Dragon. Dark Albion. Um, I have rules for domain level play and um, mass combat. And in the old school companion, I take those rules, I make them slightly more generic, not specific to the Albion setting. And they are included in a section that you find in um, general character activities here. So we go to page 151. And uh, you see a number of rules that are kind of for slightly more... Uh, advanced play, as it were. Um, so you have stuff to to like own your own farmstead, for starters. You know, so if you're if you're a small hold uh, owner and how your farm works, working as a mercenary. If you're a cleric running a clerical priory. If you're a magister joining the collegium. If you want to do like merchant caravan work, um, table for noble attention. Then you get like merchant and caravan activities so there's like um all kinds of stuff for getting you know your your merchant merchandise into uh into the cities um and then but that's not actually the the thing i was looking for here so where is the thing i was <laughs> look, at that, look at that little paw where is the thing i was looking for um here hang on let's look this up again um sorry guys i <laughs> i forget where my own stuff is this is the funny part um oh sorry domain management and mass combat there we go so i thought they were in the same section but they're not they're actually this is actually much earlier so here you got the critical tables and then here we are this is this is the right section this is uh Domain management and mass con combat. And it's basically the same as in the book. So since Meatball is sitting on that book, I'm going to look through this one. Um, this is what I wanted to say in this video, though, like before I get get started on that, is that um, there are, an, a contrary to what this video is probably going to be titled, where I'm going to say something, it's going to be titled something like, you know, the right way to do <laughs> uh, domain play. Um in fact, there's, there is more than one way to do domain play. And basically, you can do – well, it's just like, let's say, at the level of individual play, if you're playing your character. In some campaigns, in, you know, in most D&D campaigns for sure, you keep careful track of your gold pieces and your equipment and your encumbrance, right? And, and all of that matters so that you're, you know, your, your character can't just be you know, carrying around a grand piano and he – he ha you have to know, you know, he has to have, you know, have to know how much money he has to buy something, um, and and then things will have a fixed cost. You'll have to manage those costs, 
and so on and so forth. Now, in some campaigns, you might just say, well, no, let's just abstract all that, right? Like he's just got a wealth level or something and it doesn't really matter. Now, that, that's rare in D&D, but it's a lot more common if you get into games that are set like in the you know modern era, for example. So like in the Invisible College, I basically do that. You have levels of wealth and it's assumed your character is like, you know, paying the rent and driving a car or, or, you know, potentially if they're at that level of wealth anyways, and that they'll have credit cards, but you're not keeping track. Like you're not doing a bank balance as part of your modern era campaign, right? Cause that's, that's just too much work. Um, with domains, it's basically the same. So you can do a domain where you're micromanaging every tiny detail, right? So you're figuring out the lands, the plots of those lands, who's in those lands, how much they're cultivating, what that cultivation ends up being worth in theory, then how, how to get it to market and the costs. And, you know, you could have the names of every peasant that you, that works in your land and, 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 you know, you're, you're, you can construct battlements one brick at a time and keep track of all of that. And I mean, that's theoretically possible, or you can have a very abstract system where you have some very generic categories. Now, um, I tend more towards the latter, where I where I prefer that domain level play be done through abstract attributes, um, because it's very likely, in my experience, that not every character is going to be engaging in domain level play. So, for example, if you're running like Lion and Dragon and you're doing like the Dark Albion campaign. Um, there's a very good chance that maybe one of your characters might at some point be a nobleman and maybe even end up being the nobleman that, that actually runs a, you know, a, a fiefdom, um, a lordship. And uh, then they'll have to uh, make use of that estate and, and work it through. Uh, but the other player characters aren't going to be that, right? So um, if you're – the problem with the micromanagement school, let's say, of um, domain play – is that you have to end up dedicating a serious amount of time to one player or to two players or however many are doing it, right? So unless the campaign itself is that sort of campaign, it's like a birthright campaign where everybody's meant to have their own house or lordship or whatever, and then they're, they're managing that domain together or, you know, they're managing their own domain separately and maybe even feuding with each other or whatever. If it's that sort of campaign, that makes sense. Otherwise, you have a problem because then suddenly – one player's character takes up a much larger part of the time of the session than everybody else's player's character. Um, in the same way, you sometimes have these problems in other in other capacities. Like, you know, sometimes in some systems, magic users take up a lot of downtime activity that, that becomes a bit of an annoyance, right? Um, so for me, in the Dark Albion and the... Uh, old school companion, I created some very simple attributes. I have military power, financial power, and political power. And then, you know, there are generation ro rules for like, if you want to set up and roll, generate your own um, type. And it's modified by, you know, what type of Lord you are, just how Lordly you might be or, or not. Um, you might get bonuses or not. Um, and regions from where you are, you know, they, they also modify the thing. And then so you can use those things in different ways, right? So there, there are random events which can affect, you know, it can give you bonuses or penalties to these three attributes. And obviously, um, the, uh, just a sec here, the... Military power will, will be used in the mass combat system to represent how many troops you can add to an army. Financial power is points that you that that are not money, but that you can that you can end up spending for money, right? To to represent enormous sums of money, in fact, if you if you're liquidating them. And then uh, political power is designated as a kind of percentage ability of having political influence in the kingdom, you know, like being able to get the attention of the king, being able to get favor at court, et cetera, et cetera. You know, anytime you want to do something that requires some political maneuver, you would roll the percentage dice for that. Um, and that's basically how it went, right? Like mass combat is also like done with a gen general resolution 
um, where you combine the total values of the, the different lords that are coming to a battle. You add up their military power. You give some important modifiers for special units. And and then the leaders of the, the commanders of the armies will do an opposed check. And that will determine whether it's a, you know overwhelming victory, a slight victory, etc. And meanwhile, what I added in the mass combat system is a situation where you can have the player care uh, just focus more you know more detailed focus on specifically what the player characters are doing in the fight in the middle of the fog of war because that what they do whether they triumph or, or fail is is to a certain degree separate from whether the big army triumphs or fails right because in the medieval army you didn't have like the sort of coherence that you would normally have so they could have a really good day and then end up having to still flee at the end because the, the battle is lost, right? Or they might have a really crappy day, but, you know, their side ends up winning. Um, so you can do still do combat encounters. And then there's a nifty little table here in case you just want to randomly see what happened to you in the battle. Um, but I'm more, mostly interested right now in talking about the domain play than the battle system. But as you can see, I, I prefer in both aspects to make it quite light, right? It's not... It's not going to have a bunch of complex calculations. It's not going to have a ton of um, special rules. Now, here's the, the the surprise, though, is that I'm I've now been thinking about this quite a lot because I'm writing a new book, Baptism of Fire, which is going to be set not in 15th century uh, England or an analog thereof. Um, but rather in early 11th century Poland. So we're instead of the very end of the Middle Ages, you're talking about barely the beginning of it. You know, we're talking about like 1025, you know. So this is um, a, a very different society. And I, I do think that this system that I have here works quite well for a late medieval system, you know, one that is essentially now post-feudal and is... Um, it, it has a lot of professionals in it, right? So you have that that you can reflect that you have officers in your in your lands who are um, who are specifically trained to come to perform certain tasks and so on, right? But when it comes to my next book, I'm going to have a totally different domain system than this one, and uh, that's because in Baptism of Fire, you're talking about a very early medieval setting. So this is the thing you. The type of domain system you have, you'd think that, well, you know, a domain set system is a domain system. That's not true. The type of setting you have has a massive influence on it. Why? Well, let me put it in this example, comparing Dark Albion with uh, Baptism of Fire, right? So in the late medieval period, it can make sense that the most important thing you have is like your political influence, your military influence, and your and your um, fine, and, and your, your your land wealth. Okay, because you're going to have peasants that you can work. They're no longer, most of them are no longer even serfs at that point, right? So you can bring people in. So they're not all that important anymore. Um, ironically, if you had serfs, then that those were important because they were bound to you, but you were also therefore bound to them. And, and you couldn't just replace them, you know. Um, but in the early medieval period, if you, you have a much more chaotic situation, um, Poland in 1025 was pre-feudal. It had not yet developed into a feudal system. It was it was emerging in this weird spot in between, you know, coming out of the tribal system, the system of, you know, tribes and clans, and into a medieval, an er, very, very early medieval world. And there, you'd have to use a totally different mechanic because you can't talk about financial power um, because there is barely finance happening there, right? Like in, in that setting, the amount of coinage that's a, that's going to be uh, flowing through that setting is going to be very, very small. It's going to be barely a trickle in, in only like, there's only three major trade roads that cross through Poland at that time, you know, and, and major is by the context of that time. So, so that doesn't work. Political influence doesn't work the same way. Political influence goes through clan more than anything else. It, it, you're, it's not about you or you having influence because of how impressive you are as an individual, you know. So that has to go out the window. So what and and basically the most important thing in that context because there is no professional class either, right? Like there's some there's a few monks, a few priests that are just starting to come into Poland as it's being Christianized, right? But it but but you don't have um, a vast number of 
skilled professionals to do things for you. Okay, so a lot of the things you could do, like construction or like administration, um, you can't do. So you've got to think about what setting you have. In that setting, as opposed to this one, in baptism of fire, the most important um, attribute has to be first, how many peasants do you have to work your land? Second, are those peasants happy or not? Right? (laughs) How loyal are they to you? In Baptism of Fire, there'll have to be a special mechanic to reflect the possibility of pagan revolt, which is something that was that was really happening very often in that period. That you know, pagans who'd basically you know the the, the the upper classes had converted to Christianity, but the the peasants were still all, especially in the countryside, were still all pagans, and they really weren't happy about it. You know, um, and then your personal retainers, right? Do you have men at arms and headmen to 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 run things? Because you're not going to be running things, right? You're going to be too busy going off and fighting battles and killing monsters or whatever with your party. So the loyalty of those retainers becomes central, right? The happiness of your peasants, the loyalty of your of your toughs, of the goons that you have working for you, are going to be the two central elements that you need to consider. And so that makes it a totally different set of of mechanics, right? And I'm going to have that in my next thing. So there and in fact, it is true. I, I have deceived you. There is not one single way to do domain mechanics right. But there are ways to do it better than others. And part of what this means is first, you have to think about what does your group want, right? If your group is all in on this stuff, okay, then you can do a totally detailed set of, of domain mechanics. If they're not, if if they're going to be like having a yawn fest while one excited, you know, nerd is, 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 uh, telling you about, you know, whether he's planting beets or, or, or uh, turnips in the field, you know, in field 52, and then he'll tell you what is in field 53, uh, you know, you're going to have a real problem there, right? So you need to go with something more abstract, like what you have in, in these books. Um, but then besides that, the setting that you're playing affects domain play, right? I mean, because if you're playing a generic D&D game, it's like, it seems it, in, in some ways that 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 doesn't have a lot of sense to it, right? Like you can have, you know, suddenly you're ninth level, so now you're a lord, so you get to make a domain, right? And then uh, in different settings, how that comes to pass seems to make very little sense, right? It's like suddenly they can sense, oh, you've got the force field of a ninth level guy, so now you get a domain. But okay, but then then you can suspend all disbelief if you want to, or you have to do something credible, but then it, you have to decide, what is the credible thing? How does how does a person make a domain? Like, do they make a domain by going out into the wilderland and carving it out? Okay, that's that's one thing. If not, if it's given to them by a lord, what system are you using? What is what system is you know the system in the dales, right? Like, how does that work, right? And you you have to make the domain that you create fit that, right? So, and if you're doing something historic, even more so. You know, whereas if you're doing something really weird or gonzo, or you're just not too worried about it, you could just you know, leave it off, but then don't give it the undue weight that it would not deserve, right? Um, so you have to think through what your players want, what your group wants, what you want as well, and what works in the setting that you are playing, right? If you're playing a Stone Age setting, you're not going to be using the domain rules of like Adventure Conquer King, you know, like it's, it won't make sense. All right. So uh, that's, that's basically what I had to say about this. Um, Meatball has gone into the cleaning herself phase here yeah all right so i guess that's everything for today if you like this video again please share it hit like subscribe if you haven't subscribed um and uh keep checking me out for more videos i'll uh be posting some soon i imagine currently smoking well or about to start smoking as you can see i haven't even lit it yet uh this is a peterson oversized poker plus uh our gentle roots. Thank you.